For analysis of this situation journalists are facing in Ukraine, let's talk to investigative journalist Tony Gosling. Tony, thanks for joining us. Now, there have been suggestions the journalist was killed on purpose. Do you believe that could be the case or could it have been a mistake because it was, I guess, dark? We're going to a conflict zone, a military base at night, albeit a deadly mistake. What's your thoughts on that? Well, some ceasefire, isn't it? We've had five journalists dead now. This is the latest. Uh, all, it seems, killed by the Kiev regime. I mean, these are our eyes and ears, aren't they? And uh, they are, uh, there's a, whether it's actually deliberate or not, it's almost impossible to tell in these sorts of situations. Uh, but they're our eyes and ears. And it means that there's a, a massive dissuasion for journalists to cover these subjects. It means they have to get, you know, all sorts of gear, flak uh, proof gear, this sort of thing, into go into these reasons. It makes it much more difficult. But I think actually it should be encouraged us to report more on these sorts of scenes. But we're seeing really over the last maybe uh, 10, 15 years or so, more and more of a focus on trying to take out journalists. We had Terry Lloyd died in the very first days of the Iraq war, for example. He was an independent journalist who wasn't being protected by the military on either side. He was uh, working for ITN. Uh, also, uh, in the Iraq war, we had uh, the Royal Artillery taking out the main transmitter tower of Saddam Hussein in Baghdad, which people at the time argued was actually was a war crime. So we're seeing the different type of warfare than, than has been traditional. This kind of media war and also, of course, the very important economic warfare going on too. So I think it's impossible to say at this stage whether uh, this was deliberate or not. And just on that point, there was another incident of journalists caught under fire the same day. Let's take a listen to one of those journalists. There was a panic. I didn't know what to do. I just laid on the road face down or moved in short runs, all to save myself from the constant mortar shelling that lasted about two hours. It was very scary, especially for a person who isn't entirely prepared. And that is amid a ceasefire. Why are such violations being allowed, Tony? Well, I think it's because the ceasefire at the moment uh, doesn't really seem to be a serious one, doesn't seem to be holding. Uh, I mean, we've got a very serious problem with these key positions within the Kiev government, uh, that is to say uh, the Attorney General, uh, the Interior Ministry and the Defence Ministry, all held by people who are members of fascist parties. And I think really in order to move forward, we've got to have the Germans and the French, some real heavy weights in Europe, putting some pressure on the Kiev government to remove these fascists from these key positions in the Kiev government. I mean, we've seen quite a lot of bias also in reporting, and we're talking about the media war just now. We keep hearing about the pro-Russian separatists, but we don't hear about the pro-NATO uh, side of the Kiev regime, because actually they are very uh, pro-NATO. NATO, it looks like we're involved uh, in supporting elements uh, of UNA, USO, which is a fascist group in uh, Ukraine, in the run-up to the coup which happened in February. So, you know, what we need is better reporting and more balance from all sides, if at all possible. Yeah, Russian media workers have been killed, wounded, kidnapped and threatened numerous times that I've been sitting in this seat. I've been talking about stories for a long time now. And Moscow has been demanding investigations time and again. Why are these calls being ignored? Well, I don't think there's a political will for it. And this is where it comes back to the EU, particularly. Um, the US is quite clearly behind the new Kiev government, but the EU is wavering a little bit. I mean, it's given a lot of money to this new government, and it should be asking uh, for a quid pro quo for that and say, well, look, if we're going to keep propping up this Kiev regime, we've got to make sure that there is actually a democratic government and not fascists. We can't cope with having fascists in uh, Europe. Uh, we saw what happened to that sort of 30, 40 years ago, and uh, all the time that there is this influence within the Kiev uh, regime, I'm afraid we're going to have all sorts of double dealing with uh, journalists possibly even being targeted, as you were suggesting there. That's the last thing we need, uh, and the EU has really got to put the pressure on to stop this. And international freedom of press bodies have sounded the alarm over the threat to journalists, but there has been very little reaction from Western leaders. Just briefly, why is that? <laughs> Well, I think that there is a tacit acceptance of what's happened. I mean, we've had the Orange Revolution many years, so was it uh, uh, eight years, ten years ago, uh, which was where the Kiev government was brought over to more, be more pro-Western. So there's been a tussle over Ukraine going on for the last 12 years or so. Uh, we had Victoria Newland saying that, that something like eight billion 
dollars has been spent, uh, maybe a bit less than that actually, but certainly billions of US dollars have been spent on trying to get regime change in Ukraine. And this is where we really have to stop this idea that we can go around the world doing these regime change like happened in Libya. Incidentally, in Libya, also violating international law, British ships were jamming Colonel Gaddafi's uh, broadcasting systems. So as you can see, we've really got to step back from this idea that we can try and control the perceptions of people. And of course, killing journalists is one way that these fascists are doing that. Investigative journalist Tony Gosling, thanks for your input.